In the last six lectures, we have been looking at heroic myths and at the concept of the heroic monomyth. We've looked at the myths of Heracles and King Arthur and Jason and Mwindo, and we've examined all of them in light of the, the idea of the monomyth. We've already mentioned this, and you've perhaps noticed along the way a real paucity of female heroes. Virtually all of the heroes that we've looked at, and most of them in world mythology, tend to be male. And the theories of the monomyth tend to favor the idea that the hero is masculine as well. So what we want to do in this lecture is we want to take a look more closely at why this is so. And then we want to ask what would a female hero look like? And then give a couple of examples of female heroes who have survived in patriarchal ages that succeeded the invasions that overwhelmed the ancient world, the ones that we looked at back in lecture 16. In both Ronk's and Campbell's monomyth theories, the assumption is generally that the hero is male. It is, he is necessarily male in Ronk. Ronk relies on the work of Freud, who always thought that the father-child relationship was the most important in human development. And Ronk's family romance, like Freud's theories, focuses on the father-son-mother triangle. So for Ronk, the hero has to be male. Jung and Campbell are far more flexible in this, on, on that issue. Both say that heroes can be either male or female, but in analysis, Campbell usually assumes a male protagonist so that females show up as goddesses, temptresses, earth mothers, and therefore always in supporting roles to the hero. Jung wound up in a similar place. Um, although he, he identified consciousness with masculinity and the unconscious with femininity, and that already poses some obstacles to considering uh, a, a, a female hero. But he also said that when a male sets out on his journey, he's really exploring his own unconscious, which is the feminine side of himself. And he's aided in his quest by his female anima figure. On the other side, a female quester, who should be guard, guided by her archetypal male figure, as she explores her conscious or masculine side. So that there should be some balancing here. Still, in spite of that, most of Jung's analysis and Campbell's assume a male hero, and the masculine pronoun he is usually more than just a convention of language in their analyses. And on top of that, um, most heroes of world mythology are male, so that just simply tips the scale in that direction. The bias has been reinforced culturally for centuries. Men have been expected to be individualists, creating their own paths, developing themselves in personal ways. Women were understood either as temptresses or femme fatales or helpmeets, helping their men survive in a hostile world by providing grace and comfort and house and home. And this is a real liability. If, if a woman is confined to the house and if a hero has to travel to new lands and encounter dragons, it's going to be really difficult for, for a woman to achieve that, achieve that kind of status. The implication for much of history, unfortunately, has been that indi independent women were thought of as villains, not as heroes, and they were punished for their presumption. Think, of, for example, of what happens to Bizet's Carmen in his opera. So the, the, the roles for women in heroic literature and myth have mostly involved staying at home and waiting for the hero to return to claim her as his prize and then marry her, and that's mostly the end of the story. Joanna Ross, um, in an essay called What Can a Heroine Do or Why Women Can't Write, um, puts a very witty twist on, on this whole question of what women do in, in literature and myth. She says, the tone may range from grave to gay, from the tragedy of Anna Karenina to the comedy of Emma, but the myth is always the same. Innumerable variants on falling in love, on courtship, on marriage, on the failure of courtship and marriage, how she got married, how, did, how she did not get married, always tragic, how she fell in love and committed adultery, how she saved her marriage, but just barely, how she loved a vile seducer and eloped and died in childbirth. <laughs> and, and, that's, and, that's mostly the, uh, and that's mostly the end of the story. That's uh, traditionally the way we've looked at things, but Carol Pearson and Catherine Pope, in a book called The Female Hero in American and British Literature, suggest that there are, there are so many reasons why a female hero shouldn't be so different from a male hero. 
A male hero, as we've seen, has to step outside the conventions and expectations of his own community to venture into unknown lands to bring back the boon that will benefit that community. The female hero can break with her community just by being a hero, by behaving differently from conventional sisters, the ones who stay at home and wait for Prince Charming to ride by. Both Jung and Campbell insist that the heroic task involves finally a blending of masculine and feminine qualities. So, whether a hero is male or female, he or she must incorporate into him or herself previously unknown qualities into that self. The female hero can set out on a journey looking for a hero to save her from a dragon, but like the male hero, she has to learn that the guardians of the thresholds aren't external, but are part of herself, the way Inanna recognizes that Ereshkigal is not an alien, not another person, but is part of her own self. And the final states of the hero are often portrayed as androgynous in some way. Pearson and Pope point out that Jesse Weston in her From Ritual to Romance notices how often the grail and the sword are pictured together, male and female symbols in a kind of erotic union, which represents the psychological idea of a complete self, the awareness that male and female heroes are fundamentally alike and both fully human, and that a completed hero must involve both sides of the gender of the gender balance. Pearson and Pope put it this way in talking about this issue. Um, they say, indeed, the female hero learns a series of paradoxical truths. Self and other, mind and body, spirit and flesh, male and female, are not necessarily in opposition to one another. The hero's reward for violating the sex role taboos of her society is the miracle of combining inner wholeness with outward community. Such a shift of consciousness cannot be taught, it can only be achieved. In Lecture 16, we saw that part of the problem of seeing the female hero at all is that by the time most of our myths were written down, the invasions and the impositions of high patriarchy had already occurred, and so most myths are written along male lines. Goddesses, as we noted, were either raped or married into subordinate roles like Hera, or they were allowed to keep some heroic qualities by being de-sexed and made masculine like Athena, or they were downgraded from primary goddess to consort of a male god to merely human like Nu Kua in Chinese mythology. That's why, as we said before, it is so important for us to learn how to read between the lines to see what an older story underneath the one that we can read might have looked like. Meredith Powers does something very like this in a really good book called The Heroine in Western Literature. What I want to do is follow her reading of an, an ancient myth, the ancient myth of Demeter and Persephone from Greece, in which she tries to uncover what that story might have looked like, the story underneath the story, to see the shape of, of a, a story that features a female hero. Demeter is, of course, the corn goddess, or the goddess of cereal, or grain. The Haroma name is, in fact, Ceres, from which our word cereal is derived. Demeter is the daughter of Cronus and Rhea, and hence is a sister of Zeus. Um, and the two of them together become the parents of Persephone. When Persephone is, reaches the nubile age, um, Hades, her uncle, makes a kind of a deal with Zeus that he will abduct her and haul her away to the underworld where she will become his consort. It happens when Persephone is out gathering flowers with her companions one day. She wanders just a little too far away from her companions because she sees this one bouquet of exquisite flowers that she really wants to look at. And when she's just far and away off away from her companions, a gap opens up and Hades emerges from under the ground in his chariot. He seizes the maiden and carries her off down to his world, but not before she has uttered such a piercing cry that her mother from the other end of the world can hear it, but gets there just a moment too late. She doesn't know what the cry means, she doesn't know what's happened to her daughter, and she doesn't know where her daughter is. 
the, the myth from here on is full of goddesses. This is, this is a great goddess myth. It's, it's, it's got goddesses everywhere you turn. Demeter herself, it's been guessed, was probably once an earth goddess with two aspects. She was both mother and maid. She could produce the harvest as the mother, but then she would become a maid again in the spring to start the new season over again. Eventually, those two aspects led to two separate deities, a mother and a daughter. And then, so we have two instead of one in there, and there are lots of other goddesses in the myth. Gaia, we remember from creation myths, Gaia is the earth, the great mother. She was one time was the great creatrix responsible for creating everything that is. In this, in this story, she obeys Zeus and Hades. She's the one who sets out those particularly attractive flowers to bait the trap that's set for Persephone. So that means that by the time we get this story told down, Gaia has been degraded. She was once divine and powerful herself. Now she takes orders from a male sky god. She takes orders from Zeus and Hades who have her help them trap uh, Persephone. Like Rhea, Demeter's mother, um, she later in the poem, uh, or in, in the story, uh, Rhea, Demeter's mother, will go with her daughter to intercede with Zeus. Still later, she convinces her daughter to teach the arts of agriculture to humans and to teach them the secrets which became the Eleusinian mysteries, which offer the possibility of immortality to its initiates. There's this, there, throughout this entire, the entire story, there's this suggestion of a great solidarity of community of women, um, all kind of working together and helping each other. And this, we're reminded, is vis-a-vis is -vis the individualism that male heroes are expected to show on their quests. As Persephone is carried off, she cries out to her father, who isn't going to help her in the first place because he's in on the abduction. Um, we remember that he and Hades worked this out together. In Hades, she continues to cry out, but now she cries out for her mother. Her mother can hear her but doesn't know where she is or where the cry is coming from. Eventually, another goddess, Hecate, tells uh, Demeter what happened, and Helios, the son, tells her where her daughter is. Once she, once she knows what's happened, Demeter exiles herself from Olympus. She removes herself from the community of the gods. And she seeks comfort for, her, for the loss of her daughter in the company of mortals. Um, it, because we have to remember in, that, in this story, if, if Persephone has been carried off to the land of Hades, she is essentially dead, which means that at this point in the story, Demeter has to believe that she has lost her daughter for good. She goes, Demeter goes to Eleusis to tell to a well where the daughters of the king come to gather water. The daughters take pity on what seems an unfortunate old woman and they bring her back to the palace with them. The queen recognizes something extraordinary about this woman and she cultivates her and eventually she offers her a position as nurse to her infant son. We've already, of course, had this story before in Lecture 15 in the story of Isis. The stories are essentially identical. Like Isis, Demeter tries to give the child that she's taking care of immortality by each night placing it in the fire. The child prospers, and Demeter is partially eased of the grief of losing her own daughter by substituting this son, whom she is training for immortality as a way kind of of taking her daughter's place. But, as in the Isis story, the queen one night catches Demeter putting the child in the flames, and she screams, and Demeter flings the child down, and then she reveals herself in her full glory and demands that to win back her favor, the people must build a temple in her honor in Eleusis. The city does, and Demeter comes to live there, apart from the gods, and still mourning for her lost child. That year turns out to be a really terrible year for humans. Nothing grows, and humans seem on the verge of dying out because Demeter isn't interested in making anything grow anymore. Zeus and the other gods have to do without their offerings, and they get desperate after a while, and, and eventually they have to set out to try to placate Demeter. Zeus sends ambassador after ambassador, offer after offer, and she pays no attention. Zeus, it turns out, is powerless to force her hand. Eventually, Zeus gives in and sends Hermes to Hades to ask whether Hades will, will re release Persephone, turn her loose, send her back. Hades knows that he has to comply because his brother is stronger than he is, and Persephone is eager to go. 
But before she leaves, Hades tricks Persephone into eating one pomegranate seed. And according to the rules of Hades, once you've eaten in Hades, you can't go home again. So now the negotiations have to start all over again, and a new compromise has to be reached in which Persephone will split her time between Earth and her mother on the one hand, and Hades and her husband on the other hand in six months incre six month increments. Um, another goddess comes to the rescue here in that Hecate offers to die with Persephone each year and become her surrogate mother in Hades. Goddesses standing beside each other again. At the end of the story, uh, Demeter's own mother, uh, Rhea, comforts her daughter and the presence of, that, of her mother and of the compassion and of the sort of solidarity of women prompts Demeter to grant the boon of agriculture to humans and also the Eleusinian mysteries to humans so that through the death of her own daughter, humans can have access to rebirth and immortality. It's a really stunning story. Demeter's heroism is centered on the dyad of mother and child, on whose safety, as we discover, the survival of the entire tribe depends. Her antagonists in this story are male governors, who concern, whose concerns are very different from hers. And surrounding that pair of mother and daughter, there are other mothers and daughters and foster mothers and children. There's a whole community of women who stand together in compassion for each other's problems. Their virtues um, are, stand in pretty stark opposition to those of male heroes whose goals are solitary and are usually outside the parameters of society. Women's concerns here are connections and empathy and the good of the group. Um, and that, that mother-daughter dyad, which is at the center of this, um, is very different from the typical father-son dyad, which can never really be cooperative because it's based on competition. Demeter winds up giving humankind the gifts of agriculture, and she does it without ever leaving society or going on a solitary quest. She works through her own grief by separating herself from Mount Olympus and then by investing herself in someone else, the son of the queen. She doesn't challenge Zeus, she simply responds to injustice, but she does so in a very positive way. When Zeus gives Hades permission to carry off Persephone, he ignores that mothers have any rights to their children. He assumes that a father can do anything he wants with his child. Demeter fights to win back the mother's right, but she does so without aggrandizing herself, without bringing others to submission. And the entire tribe turns out to be the beneficiary in, by way of agriculture and the Eleusinian mysteries. Powers ends uh, her chapter on Demeter with a quotation from a book by Carol Gilligan called In a Different Voice, in which she outlines some of these differences between the way we might see a female hero and a male hero. Uh, um, Gilligan says this, The elusive mystery of women's development lies in its recognition of the continuing importance of attachment in the human life cycle. Woman's place in man's life cycle is to pr protect this recognition while the developmental litany intones the celebration of separation, autonomy, individuation, individuation, and natural rights. What she's saying is that while men will go on proclaiming the need for autonomy and individuation and solitary quests, what women have to do is to protect this, what, what she calls the recognition of attachment to the human life cycle. The myth of Persephone speaks directly to the distortion in this view by reminding us that narcissism leads to death, that the fertility of the earth is in some mysterious way tied to the continuation of the mother-daughter relationship, and that the life cycle itself arises from an alternation between the world of women and that of men. That's what a female hero might look like vis-a-vis -vis the male ones we've spent a lot of time with in our last lectures. Our own age has produced a lot of female heroes, especially in literature and especially that in the novel. To illustrate this, um, I'd like to spend our last few minutes of this lecture on a 19th century female hero from a classic American novel, Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter. Now, The Scarlet Letter, I, I, I know you're going to say The Scarlet Letter really isn't a myth in the way that the other myths that we've done in this course have been, but it's at least mythical in the sense of being not literally true, but it contains a wisdom and a meaning that we can recognize anyway. And on the other hand, it's at least partly mythical in that 
that story, the story of the Scarlet Letter, has become part of our consciousness. Um, most people will recognize a reference to the Scarlet Letter, even if they've never read the book, just as many people who've never read anything about King Arthur will know what a reference to Camelot is, or people who have never read the Bible will know about Eve, the serpent, and the forbidden fruit. The Scarlet Letter has become mythical, at least in that kind of sense. And this also gives us a chance that we don't we haven't had too much chance to do in this course, aside from a little bit that we did back in Lecture 2, and that's to show some of the ways in which myths underpin and provide structure and meaning to modern works, which are based on those myths, whether self-consciously on the part of the author or, the author or not. Hawthorne called his book not a novel but a romance, which suggests that it doesn't have quite the fidelity to everyday reality that realists were beginning to use as a definition of the novel at his time, which is 1850. Um, which, of course, it being a romance rather than a novel, doesn't diminish its truth value for us, especially for those of us who have spent the last few weeks working with myths. Um, what, what I would like to suggest here is that in some important ways in this romance, Hester Prynne and Pearl are direct descendants of Demeter and Persephone, and they give us another picture of what a female hero looks like, this time in almost modern dress. You probably all know the story, but since you haven't read it since high school, perhaps, um, maybe a brief summary of how it starts um, wouldn't be a bad idea. Hester Prynne comes to Boston in the 17th century, and Boston, of course, as we know uh, from our history, was a rigidly Puritan town in that, in that period. When her husband doesn't show up, he was on a separate ship, and it's understood that he was lost at sea somewhere. And then she bears an illegitimate child. She's first imprisoned, and then she's released, but ostracized from her community. She's made to wear a scarlet A, which she has to wear on, on her dress wherever she goes. She designs and, and embroiders the, the, uh, the letter herself, so it, but it, she makes it so elaborate and so arabesque that most people consider it a mark of pride rather than a mark of repentance and humility. Well, the plot thickens. We know, although nobody else in town does except Hester herself, that her husband, an elderly doctor named Roger Chillingworth, has arrived. He has sworn Hester to secrecy so she doesn't give away his identity. She has refused under all manner of pressure to divulge the name of Pearl's father. Chillingworth takes up a kind of perverse and obsessive quest to find out who that father is. He eventually fastens on a young, brilliant, beautiful minister of the, of the town's church, a young man named Arthur Dimsdale. And he eventually winds up even moving into Dimsdale's house to tend him since the minister seems to be slowly wasting away into what seems a kind of fatal illness. We learn along the way that, we learn along the way that Dimsdale is Pearl's father, and the sickness that he is suffering from is partly the result of the guilt he feels at being the shepherd of a Puritan congregation on the one hand, while holding on the other hand the awareness of his own sinfulness. There's a lot of interaction among these characters, and um, I recommend that you reread it. It's still a great read after all these years. Toward the end of the book, Hester and Arthur plan to escape with Pearl back to Europe somewhere where they can live as a family and start life all over again, far, far from, from Puritan Boston. But Chillingworth somehow learns of their plan, and he books passage on the same ship. So on the day before the ship is supposed to leave, Dimsdale mounts the town scaffold, and he confesses his guilt, and then burying his breast shows that he has branded on his chest a scarlet letter A. He dies on that scaffold. Pearl sends him off with a kiss. Chillingsworth dies within a year, and then Hester and Pearl leave town. They leave Boston. Years later, Hester comes back herself without Pearl. Pearl has now married and has moved away to Europe. No one by this time would anymore insist that Hester still wear her Scarlet A, but she does anyway. She becomes known in Boston for her charitable work. She dies years later, and she's buried next to Dimsdale with a single Scarlet Letter A on the tomb that they share. Here in this story, the hero is sent on her quest, not by personal choice, but by circumstance, like the princess who drops her golden ball down the well, or Gilgamesh who's sent off on his quest by the death of Enkidu, or like Muindo, driven out of town by his father. 
Here it's the pregnancy and birth of Pearl that sends Hester out of the comfortable confines of her community into a solitary and fearful world. She's forced into heroic consciousness by the fact of her motherhood. As the narrator tells us about her at this point in, in the story, standing alone in the world, alone as to any dependence on society, and with little Pearl to be guided and protected, alone and hopeless of retrieving her position, even had she not scorned to consider it desirable, she cast away the fragments of a broken chain. The world's law was no law for her mind. The narrator tells us that in fact, for a while, revolutionary thoughts visited Hester, thoughts that would not have dared to enter any other dwelling in New England. The symbol for Hester as the, as the, as the novel goes along is a wild rose bush which grows outside the prison door. Once on her quest, her heroic virtues are unmistakably female, standing for hours on that scaffold while the community waits for her to identify Pearl's father, she retreats into herself to find strengths and values that will allow her to stand against her entire community. What she learns there standing on the scaffold is that she has a choice of whether to give in or not, despite the enormous pressures that are arrayed against her. And she wins, reaffirming in the process the act that had generated Pearl in the first place in opposition to all that the patriarchal culture can throw against her. Powers says this about, about her. She says, alone, apart, she accepts herself as a living critic of the society which sought to subjugate her. Alone, apart, and you imagine 17th century Puritan Boston, how alone and how apart she really is. In fact, Hester becomes a kind of another, another Demeter. Like Demeter and Persephone, Hester and Pearl are the dyad at the center of this story that makes sense of it. Like Demeter, Hester sometimes gives herself over to grief, but sometimes she also gives herself over to seasons of great pride and joy in her daughter. Also like Demeter, she accepts her position outside of society without standing in, without standing in radical opposition to it. Like Demeter with Zeus, she resists patriarchal authority without attacking it. She, in fact, initially survives in her community as a kind of artist, doing such fine needlework that even respectable women have to come to her since no one does this kind of work better, even though they would never invite her into their homes or even greet her when they meet her on the street. But as Pearl grows up, Esther also becomes a kind of ministering angel, helping the poor, visiting the sick, until some people begin to think that the A stands for able, not for adulteress. Again, like Demeter, she turns personal grief into a boon for the community. She comes very close even to saving Dimsdale, but when that fails, she metamorphoses once again, disappearing for a time, and then reappearing, still wearing that familiar A, now, but now no longer as a sign of sin, but as a sign of a boon brought back to her community. Like Demeter, she has never really left her community, and the heroism that she expresses are, is expressed in communal gestures, not in individualistic ones. That's uh, perhaps what a female hero would look like. The arc of her journey could look the same as a male one, but it embodies all of the values that the male hero, trying to find his anima, goes out to seek. The narrator gets the last word about Hester here, and it's such a beautiful ending for the, uh, for the novel that I want to read you just the last paragraph. This is what, this is what the narrator, the unnamed narrator, says about, uh, about Hester. And as Hester Prynne had no selfish ends, nor lived in any measure for her own profit and enjoyment, people brought all their sorrows and perplexities and besought her counsel as one who had herself gone through a mighty trouble. Women, more especially, in the continually recurring trials of wounded, wasted, wronged, misplaced, or erring and sinful passion, or with the dreary burden of a heart unyielded because unvalued and unsought, came to Hester's cottage, demanding why they were so wretched and what the remedy. Hester comforted and counseled them as best she might. She assured them, too, of her firm belief that at some brighter period, when the world should have grown ripe for it, 
in heaven's own time, a new truth would be revealed in order to establish the whole relation between man and woman on a surer ground of mutual happiness. That's what a female hero might look like. Next time, we are going to continue our, our looks at, at, at female heroes by looking into a different place, into fairy tales. It's a place where, according to many scholars and critics, female heroes have found their homes. Fairy tales are one of the places where mythology winds up, in fact, surviving in tales that we use to teach our children about the way things are. Next time we will take a look at two fairy tales that you're probably already familiar with. One, a classical one, Cupid and Psyche, and one, a more modern one, Beauty and the Beast. That's next time.